let's begin with the following. We're all familiar with the fact that, in theory, the Siddur, we pray three times a day. Where does this come from? In fact, Maimonides, the great Rambam, the great codify of Jewish law, states the following. It's a scriptural commandment to pray. What does this mean? Just, just define that. The truth is, as we continue to learn, we'll discover layers and layers to prayer. But the most basic meaning of prayer is, the most elementary meaning. Anybody? What's like the basic function of prayer? What are we doing? Getting very deep, just very, very basic, very, very, as a child, very simple, very basic. Why do, why do most of us pray? Because <laughs> thanking God when things go well, and if... Asking for help, yeah. So basically prayer is that a Jew is to know that if you need help, so of course you've got to do, make, you have to do what you have to do. You have to make the basic natural channels. But at the end of the day, I'm going to make this lower. At the end of the day, the Almighty runs the world. So prayer is a recognition that Hashem runs the world. And therefore, as mentioned, when things go well, you thank. If you need, who do you turn to? It's Hashem. For most people, this is the essence of prayer. It's really the latter more than the thank you. Halavai was the thank you. But most of us will pray because we need legitimate needs. From health to livelihood to even forgiveness. So that's one basic, the basic definition of prayer. So the, the, base, the ruling, again, Maimonides is, from the Torah perspective, Once a day is enough. Once a day a person turns to God for one of these requests, either thank you or please grant me or forgive me, and thereby the person fulfills their obligation. Initially, friends, going back historically, there was no set text for prayer whatsoever, as there shouldn't be. I mean, you're talking to God. So you've got to use your words and your language. And I'll hasten to add that even though now we do have a formula a text, a siddur, the word siddur means, anybody? Order. order, a structured order. Nonetheless, one should, one ought, pray, and I'm sure we all do, spontaneously. Pray to Hashem in our own language as we feel the need, as we're moved. So again, the basic mitzvah is once a day. Others hold not even once a day, just whenever you need to. If today... There's nothing that prompts you to say thank you or there's no particular need, then you don't have to pray. But if you have a need or you want to say thank you, well, you should know who to ask from and who to thank. So there are two views here, whether it's a daily thing or when you need to. Either way, this is Maimonides and Nachmanides. From either perspective, what you're hearing is that the essence of prayer is your language, your words, either daily or when you need it. So where does the three times a day thing come? Now, before I go further, we need to point out the following as well. Which is really lecture number three, and that is the obligation of women to pray. What I said till now is universal. Here's the principle. The principle is that the starting point is men and women are obligated to do everything God commands. That's the starting point. There is an exemption. The exemption is women are exempt from any positive commandment, which means you should stop what you're doing, whatever it is, and do this now. Exempt from all of those. And the basic reason is because she has much more greater, greater obligations, family, children, etc., that she can't stop what she's doing because that's critical and do whatever. All the prohibitions, the Torah says don't, they apply to everybody universally, men and women. It's the positive commands that are bound by time she's exempt from. 
Now this prayer thing, because it's every day, at any point in the day, according to the Rambam, according to Nachmanides, at per need, both views, it's not really linked to a particular time. Which, all to say that a woman, in essence, is obligated to pray just like the male. But we will see in lesson number three, how does that translate practically? Because the guy, Davins, very much linked to particular times, three times a day. So we want to understand this, first of all, the basic, where does the three times a day come from? And then kind of put the sitter under a greater microscope and discover its various uh, sections and so on. This is all critical to our evolution because when we come to the third lesson, which will address things like, you've come late to shul, what's the most important thing to say? This lesson will help you understand that because we understand how the prayer was built. You'll already get a sense of priority in prayer. Okay? So, where does the three times a day thing come from? There are two classic views in the Talmud. Before you leave, friends, I want you to take this little booklet that Levi put together today, and it has pretty much all the source material we're going to refer to tonight for your review. So there are two views. How did it start? One view is, oh, it goes way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our patriarchs. If you examine scripture critically, for each one of them, the Torah describes some kind of conversation or talk. Abraham spoke, and then later Isaac did, and Jacob did, and our sages, looking critically at these words, derived that they're actually praying. Moreover, if you look at when, the context there is Abraham is in the morning, Yitzchak's in the afternoon, Isaac, and Yaakov is at night. So who were the ones to establish to pray three times a day? Abraham, he established the morning prayer. Then Yitzchak added his son, Isaac added the afternoon prayer, and then Jacob added the evening prayer. That's one view in the Talmud. There's a second view, finally. There's a second view that says, no, prayer has to do with the temple. Let's explain. A bit of history here. The temple, my friends, is the focal point when it stood, and it stood in total for well, starting with Moses and the destruction of the second temple, it stood for over a thousand years, pretty much uninterruptedly. And it was the focus of all Jewish life for the simple reason the temple is a place where God's presence is manifest on earth. And what happened in the temple occupies the lion's share, the greatest part of the Chumash. The five books of Moses, the one subject that has, gets the greatest attention is the service in the temple because that's the focal point of our people and for that matter, the world. So in the temple there were services as described in detail in Torah. What happened was when the first temple was destroyed, no sacrifices, no offerings, it was at that time between the first and second temple, under the leadership of the great Ezra, this, this is so loud, Ezra the scribe, I think you got it, while it's ringing, you got to make it lower, I think. That's the key. This is your telephone. Maybe it's just bothering me and nobody else. Am I right? <laughs> nobody else. It's just me. Because I think it bothers you, so it bothers me. If it don't bother you, I'm okay with it. Okay. So, under the leadership of Ezra the scribe, who headed what is known in Jewish literature is, as the men of the great assembly. This is simply the high court of 71 sages, which we had uh, from the time of Moses all the way down to the destruction of the second temple 2,000 years ago. So that thousand year period always had uh, a high court. But this was a particularly noteworthy one because this was led under the leadership of this great man Ezra who was comparable to Moses. At any rate, friends, this august body of sages enacted many things which form the basis of rabbinic law to this day. And one of them, those things is to pray three times a day. Why did they do it? To in lieu of and replace the service in the temple. 
Because in the temple, friends, there were essentially, on a, a regular day, there was a morning sacrifice brought on behalf of the entire people and an afternoon one. Hence, Shachar is the morning service, Mincha the afternoon service. Mayriv, evening service, that's because invariably the offerings that were brought by individuals, this was the public sacrifices on behalf of the entire congregation, but there were many offerings brought by individuals for a host number of reasons. Without going into why people would bring an offering, it's the whole book of Leviticus. Bottom line is, the, t the altar where the offerings were offered were still on the altar, on the fire, till the morning. The altar was in use. So since the altar of the temple was in use at night, so the sages also enacted, but didn't make it obligatory, to daven mairif. Not obligatory, because it wasn't an actual offering brought at night. They were all brought during the days, the day. But since at night the altar was in use, so they also enacted mairif, which people undertook voluntarily, thank you, to pray. And uh, just for, if you're aware of this, you'll appreciate this. In the morning and afternoon service, the critical part of it is repeated by the reader. Said again, the main part, which we'll identify soon, for people who can't read. And that was very common in days bygone, before the era of books and so on. But it's not repeated in the evening service, never was. And now you know why, because the evening service is not as obligatory as the morning and the afternoon. All to say, the second view is saying that three times a day. No, it has to do with replacing or in lieu of the service in the temple. Morning, afternoon, and evening because, again, the altar was in use. Of course, there's no contradiction between the two views. Both are true. The forefathers, they prayed three times a day. Why did they do that? morning, afternoon, evening. They were prophets. They felt and sensed that this, these are the opportune times to connect to God. And that's how it's going to be when the temple is built and that's the way it was. So both things are true. We pray because three times a day, historically the forefathers started it. It becomes legally binding once the temple was destroyed to replace the sacrifices, the forefathers did so because they knew what was going to happen. And they knew that these times were, were, were special. Now a little insight. So, much, so far for some facts. We're going to talk about layers of prayer. We started off this evening by saying the basic meaning of prayer is I need or thank you or forgive me. It's all about me. That's the basic element of prayer. But there's a higher level of prayer it was mentioned earlier this idea of connection where prayer is about offering of the self. Where prayer is a time of where a person dedicates him or herself to the creator. I am yours. I am here to serve and it's a privilege to do so. So I want you to help me here. These two classic reasons for prayer it's not a contradiction. They started it, later it was ratified when the temple was destroyed, as we just explained. But they do emphasize these two different aspects. So help me. If prayer, we're gonna, we can, we'll consider that prayer is in place of the sacrifices. So what's prayer all about? Sacrifice. Devotion. We'll talk next week more about this. You all know, and this is a very difficult subject that many people are, well, even embarrassed with. The whole idea of offering animals on the altar, what does this mean? It's a subject that needs to be really addressed in its own right. What do sacrifices mean? Uh, there are communities that have completely cut this out of their prayer book because it's barbaric and, and, and uh, what's what I'm looking for? It's uh, hmm? pagan, yeah. Truth is, it's the most sublime divine service. And I will just say that the offering of the animal, the physical animal, is the 
incarnation of the own animal within that we are surrendering and offering to God. But more about the spiritual dimension, God willing, next week. So back to these two classic reasons. So the reason that talks about prayer in place of sacrifice emphasizes that prayer is about the offering of self. I'm yours. I dedicate myself to you. And the original or the historically first reason where the forefathers prayed, if you look at the story there, they're all asking for something. It's a prayer for some need. And both things are true. There are these two dimensions. There's prayer as a need, and then there's prayer as devotion. And several levels in between, which God willing, we will identify. Now, if I ask you, which I will, what's the most famous Jewish prayer? I was expecting that answer. Thank you. That's the answer I wanted to hear. But the truth is, it's not a prayer. The Shema is not a prayer. You're not even talking to God. You're not talking to, we don't talk to God. Look at the translation when we say the Shema. The Shema, friends, is a declaration of our faith. Hear, O Israel, God our Lord, God is one. The Torah commands us to say that. This is a commandment in the Torah, black and white, morning and evening. B'shoch b'cha, when you lie down, uvukumecha, and when you rise up. We are obligated to make this declaration of faith that there is one God and our obligation to serve God, love Him, educate our children. Mentions the mezuzah, mentions the tefillin. So this is not, again, not a prayer, a declaration of faith. So we need to understand something. The way that our sages... Is that mine? I thought I closed it. No, I did. Yeah. Um, the way the sages formulated the prayer, it works like this. The men of the great assembly we noted earlier, who established to pray three times a day, a day, again the first two being more obligatory than the evening one, when they established prayer, uh, when halacha, Jewish law speaks about prayer, we are talking about one thing, not the Shema, that's clearly not. We're talking about what we refer to as the Amida. The Amida is that standing prayer, it's the focal point of the morning, the afternoon, and the evening. It is the essence of prayer. Everything else augments it and builds up to it, as we will explain. The Amida, during the weekday, it's 18 blessings. Actually, it's 19. We call it Shemayna Esra. Shemayna Esra is Hebrew for 18. But if you count it, it's 19. What's going on? So I'll tell you. It was originally 18. And then they added a 19th. I'll tell you what that one is. And because the added one is something that's not exactly savory, or it's unsavory, the original name stuck. We didn't want to change the name from 18 to 19. What's the 19th prayer? The 19th request was added after the rise of Christianity, where Jews suffered greatly, uh, persecution and informers and so on. And uh, it's one of the prayers there in the, of the weekday, which has been modified over time because of censors. Actually, it's modified many times, but I'm just telling you, initially it was composed. God save us from our own, our own, that have abandoned our faith, embraced you know, the worship of you know who, and make, to make matters worse, are uh, seeking to uh, seduce or force other Jews to do as well. So they had to add this 19th. Now that's a very sad commentary. That's why the name still remained Shemayna Esther the 18th. If you want to see where it is in your sitter, and you will have a sitter in front of you, that's kind of interesting. It's, uh, I'll borrow your book for a second. (coughs) 
So the first time the Amida appears in the Shachris, it is on page 49, let there be no hope for informers. Malshinim is the Hebrew term there on page 49, the third paragraph. You know what it said originally? Mushumadim. You changed it. And Mushumadim means again someone who abandoned Judaism and embraced an idolatrous faith. But because of the, the, uh, the pressure, the censors and living in, in uh, Christian societies, the sages modified it and changed from, from uh, a Mushumad, that means in English someone who has What's the word? Mushumad, someone who has. Uh, huh? Pardon? Well, again, someone who abandoned Jewish faith and, and, and adopted, embraced a non, a non Jewish faith, that was changed to informer. Anyway, but we still keep it, the name Shemona Esther. So let's get back to the point I'm saying. The point I'm saying is that the essence of prayer is this Shemona Esther. It's also called the Amida because it said standing and we say it in an undertone. And the reason we say it in an undertone is because there was a great woman, her name was Hannah, the mother of Samuel. And the, the quotes in your paper, you'll look at it when you get home, the details of it. The Talmud mentions that in the story of the birth of Samuel, where she prays in the sanctuary, and we read that story in Rosh Hashanah, uh, we learn many laws of how to pray from her, till this day, which is quite telling. Now that's what to say, the sage is composed, but how you say it, how the soul or the wings of prayer, she taught us how to, how to give wings to the words that we say. So I'm just pointing out that the reason we say the um, who was the first one to do this? And we learned that from her. And that's become the way in Jewish law that a Jew has to say the Amida in a whisper that only your ears hear. That's from Hannah, as well as other laws as well. So the Amida is the essence of prayer. Now, the men of the Great Assembly also decided when they enacted three times a day, and we should also add, sometimes we have four times a day we pray, and once a year, five. Why are there four times, and when are there four times? We pray four times on Rosh Chodesh, on Shabbos, on Yom Tov. Any day which, when the temple stood, there would be an extra offering in honor of the day, we have an extra Amida. And that's why it's called Musaf. Please rise for Musaf on page, I forgot the page number. I'm, I'm sure many of you would know it. There you go, okay. Please rise for Musaf. The word Musaf means additional prayer. That's simply what it means. And it has that very unpretentious name because that's exactly what it is. It's an added prayer re representing the uh, added offering in the temple on these special days. Yom Kippur, for another reason, we have a fifth service at the end. Truth is, times of the Talmud, every national fast they had a fifth service, had the Ne'ilah service. We only do it on Yom Kippur. That has to do with the fact that it's a day of, of supplication and, and fasting. And uh, a day of, it comes to Yom Kippur, a day of profound forgiveness. So there's a fifth service. God willing, next week we'll talk about the spiritual reason why there are three and four and five. But that's for next week. Okay, so back to basics. Back, you following me? We're kind of all over the place. A little bit. There's so much I'm trying to tell you. And I, uh... So, the men of the great assembly. So they, they established the Amida three times or four times a day, as you heard now, or even five once a year. And they said that since we have to say the Shema twice a day, and the Shema, as I told you, is not a prayer, you're not talking to God, you're declaring your faith, nonetheless they married the two. They married the two, and therefore the morning 
service. And the evening service, Arvit, might have, have the Shema in it. This needs to be understood. I mean, how do the two come together? If Shema isn't a prayer, then why is it, why is it there? Convenience, you know, just put the two, the two uh, rituals or the two mitzvahs together. Obviously a very deep connection. Again, God willing, next week as we probe, the lay is a little bit deeper. Now, in terms of the structure of the prayer, so it's important to remember this. The essence of prayer is the Amidah. The Amidah. Whether it's Shabbos or Yom Tev, that's the essence of prayer. In the morning, when you're davening, there's also the Shema, which, uh, which is mandated by the Torah as well, which is critical that it be said, but we're just differentiating, pointing, pointing out here that's not really an actual prayer. Here's the interesting thing. To recite the Shema in those words, mandated in the Torah. So the question is, why isn't there a blessing before the Shema? Why aren't we saying, Blessed are you God, our Lord, Thanking God was commanded us with His, sanctified us with His commandments and commanded us to recite the Shema like you do before any mitzvah you observe. Even rabbinic mitzvahs. Not mandated directly in Torah. Before you light your Shabbos candles, which is it's quasi-scriptural. But at any rate, uh, Hanukkah candles, certainly rabbinic, and many other laws. Why isn't there a blessing for the Shema? You might ask, why isn't there a blessing for prayer? Well, the answer to that is, you don't need a bless blessing for prayer, because all prayer is a blessing. It's like a blessing for a blessing. Okay, so you can understand why there isn't a blessing. I'm about to fulfill your commandment to pray, acknowledging God when the whole prayer is a conversation with God. But the Shema, again, we're not talking to God. It's a declaration of faith. Where's the blessing? And the answer is... No, good point, but that's a completely different uh, blessing. That blessing you refer to is the mitzvah to learn Torah, which is a completely separate mitzvah from the mitzvah to pray, which begs the question, why are we even saying it in prayer? Yeah, that's our subject, Shabbos morning here. <laughs> what we're learning right now in our Shabbos morning class, you're invited to attend too, you all are, it's for men and women, uh, is this very question. Every morning we make a blessing over the mitzvah to study Torah and we say it in the prayers. We're praying now. That should be when you finish praying, you're going to start learning, then make the blessing. But we should just point out also that we, when we make that blessing in the morning prayers, we right away quote something from the Torah, otherwise it's in vain. So we make the blessings in the Torah and we quote from Scripture and from the Talmud. But, but why is it even there? That's our subject, Shabbos morning. So back to the question I'm asking. Uh, where's the blessings of the Shema? And the answer is there is, and not just one. There's a whole two blessings in the morning, long blessings from Yishtabach, if you're familiar, to the Shema, one following in the morning. So t in the, the morning Shema is two before, one after, and the evening Shema is two before and two after. But when you look at what these, what they talk about, it's a little bit difficult to understand the connection between these blessings and the Shema. Um, I think we'll have to leave that also for next week. But I'm just pointing out that there are blessings of the Shema. These were enacted by very early on. This is the men of the great assembly. So we're talking uh, two and a half thousand years ago, more. And... The blessings, we talk about angels and God's choice of us, fascinating subjects, they all augment the Shema. The sages early on you know, it, it's such an interesting thing. I, preparing for this class, so I, I personally like never bothered or was, had the interest to 
explore exactly who composed what prayer when. You sit there, you pray. But I'm giving you a class now that's tight, it's built the history of the evolution of prayer, so I better find out. So guess what? Very often, there are no clear-cut answers. Exactly when did this, who composed it, or when? The first prayer book, which is almost really the basis of our prayer book today, the first one was composed by Rabbi Amram Gaon, and he lived in the year around 580, common era. So this is post-Talmud, post the, uh, of course, post-Second Temple, post-Talmud. As per the request of the people of his day, composed for us, put together an ordered structure of prayer that was followed by other prayer books, the Rambam, Rashi, the famous Mach Savitri, it's Rashi's disciple who lived in France, in Vitri, it still exists this place, I don't know. Yes, it does. And he composed a famous prayer book that's the basis of all prayer books today. And we should say, also point out now, because there's a lot of confusion here. There's the Ashkenaz, there's the Sfard. Friends, actually, there are, I don't know the exact number. Well, I'll tell you, yes. When the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, composed the Chabad order of prayer, he had in front of him, yes, six, zero, 60 different orders of prayer, different sidurim. Please, however, know that in essence, the basic structure is all the same. It goes back to the men of the Great Assembly. The change is only very, very nuanced, extremely nuanced and subtle. And here's where there are some differences. Poems that were composed in the last few hundred years, 500, 600 years, or 400 years, that in customs, many communities ad adopted these additional piyotim, they're called, divinely inspired poems, into their prayer. But to begin with, they're not even considered as part of the body of the Siddur. They are a custom, and they vary pretty widely. But it doesn't change, really, the essence of the prayer book. You see that mostly when it comes to holidays. A regular weekday, all Ashkenaz, within Sfarad there are so many, with Ashkenaz there are so many, 60 different versions. But again, all conforming to the basic outline, and the weekday is almost the same. A word here, a word there, content, meaning, basic order is the same. So when it comes to holidays, that adding all of these songs and, and poems, that's where the big difference is. So to the untrained ears, like it's a whole different service, never mind the melodies. But really, a melody, it doesn't change the substance. And the differences in all these additions, which are just customary, and everybody who knows the prayer book knows that this is a custom. And they vary from community to community and different parts of the world. The Chabad Siddur, friends, is actually the barest Siddur possible. It's bare bones. Uh, on the one hand, the al Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, when he composed it, he actually kind of incorporated all 60 versions. Because I'll just tell you now, Okay, when the Jews crossed the Red Sea, they crossed through 12 different paths in the ocean. Why not just go in one big opening as the movie portrays it? The answer is that each has their own path. Because each tribe, 12 tribes, each tribe has its own psyche, its own um, tribal characteristic. And so though, therefore, like, for example, serving God out of love, out of awe, very different uh, um, emotional uh, relationships, uh, scholarship, action, uh, song, um, analysis, Talmudic analysis. These are all different dimensions to Judaism and different tribes would excel in one or the other. And hence, there were these 12 different paths that represent their different paths in the service of God, all leading, of course, to the same address and the same parallel complementary direction. But there was actually a 13th opening. Someone didn't know the tribal affiliation. 13th. Likewise, in the temple, there were 13 gates, 
each gate symbolically representing a particular tribe. If someone did not have a particular tribe, a convert, no particular tribe. The convert is the, the, uh, the what I'm looking for is the, the, the composite Jew, the Jew that incorporates everybody. The, the word just escapes me. If you can think of it, tell me. The what? Yeah, that too. Um, I meant to say the... So there's a 13th gate. So the al Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, when he composed the Siddur, is he, it's the 13th gate. This is a gate where every possible custom, orientation, or background can find, can find the ladder. Prayer is a ladder connecting us to God. And that's really the reason why it is so uh, simple, uh, devoid of a lot of the custom and songs and poetry that other prayer books have because they're very particular. They express a certain place in a certain time and a certain culture. Whereas the Chabad Siddur kind of transcends the cultural, spiritually cultural differences and that's why it's the, simp it's the simplest. It's, it's physically. You stack up all the prayers, the Chabad Siddur, like a, I'm just laughing because you know, I come from a background from my father's side that's not Chabad and other, other Hasidic traditions and so on. But they just can't get over Al Chabad, there comes these special days, and it's where's the special prayers and the hymns and the songs that for so many people kind of define their holidays? And Chabad, it's not there. By all means, you know, sing and say them. But the reason why it's not is precisely because it is this universal, more opening that everybody can find their place. Okay, so let's try to understand the structure a bit. So, what we've heard now is okay, I'm going to test you. Can I? Why not? Try. So, very simple question. The essence of prayer, halachically, what is it? When you say tefillah in Hebrew, I didn't do the word before, what are you referring to? The amida. Yeah, in fact, tefillah, again, in halachic literature, if you see the word tefillah, it's talking about the amida. So that was enacted, we heard the story. The Shema commanded in the Torah to read, the two were married. The two are married, that we should say the Shema before the Amida. A very simple reason is, you can see the connection before you petition God or request or so on. You affirm your faith in Him. So we declare our faith, we declare our Jewishness, we declare our, our willingness to observe His commandments, and then we petition. But over time, over time, starting in Talmudic times, which is already post the men of the great assembly. The Talmud is written, friends, towards the end of the second temple. This is composed, the Amidah, between the first and second. So towards the end of the second temple, it's hundreds of years later, over time the sages added more and more, forming the basis of the prayer book as we have it today. And these are the things that they added. The morning blessings, friends. I'll tell you right now, it's something everybody should be saying every morning. The morning blessings because... In theory, actually, in the old days, the morning blessings, which we thank God for walking, for having closed roof over our head, able to see. They're so powerful because they make us appreciate the simple gifts of life. And when they were originally composed, the idea was when you do that, when the person dresses, so who clothes the, the, the naked. Uh, when he opened his eyes before that, Pakech Ivrimi, thank God for opening his eyes. Able to stretch his limbs to be able to move mobility. He would, or she would express this as the person experienced it. For a number of reasons, we don't do it that way, but we do. They're all collected. And we do say them, you know, very early in the morning. And that's something that takes a few minutes, Hebrew or English, and everybody should say for this simple reason. What an incredible way to begin the day of not taking for granted the gift of life. You say these words, you know, thank you for waking up, that's number one, the moda'ani, and then the simple acts that we do. Now, with, with that as the foundation of our day, and if we think about you know, the things we're saying, it has to have the, the effect of shrinking, at least, you know, things that can get often get our nose bent out of shape so easily. You're all excited and upset. Or 
in the context, I'm alive, the gift of life, yeah, it's not so terrible. It's a very healthy way to start the day. Appreciation, thank you. All right, so the sages said that. They enacted very early on, Talmudic sages, the morning blessings. Talmudic times already. This is after the second temple. In addition, the sages enacted that we say songs of praise. So what I want to do now, so we get a kind of an idea of how the, the Siddur works. Okay, let's do this. Let's give out these papers. If you don't mind, give me a hand and let's distribute them. Thank you. And just get them around. And with, you have a sitter in front of you, right? So let's look here. Oh, wrong one. No, no, it's this one. Sorry. No, no, no. It wasn't that pile. This pile. This pile. Sorry, I gave you the wrong thing. No. The one that has this in the front. I'm sorry. I apologize. It has the uh, talk to me in front. Okay, we just need really this. The last page. You don't have? There's, there's more copies, I think, over there. Lady made some more. No? Didn't, Julie, you see from the table? On the table? Ah, there they are. So I'll have one too. Thank you. Last page. On the last page, you can see there are seven sections to the morning prayer. Everybody has, has it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the last page, ladies. Yep. Okay, so I want you to circle if you got a pen so that we don't lose sight you know, of really the essence of prayer and its obligation. So that would be found in section 4, where it says Shema, page 42. I'm, I'm simply following the, the pages of our Siddur. That's, you know, biblically mandated last page, back page, page 42. And then you have the Amida, section 5, pages 45 to 49. I want to look at this, that line there, because you make the following observation. The Amidah itself is divided into three parts. First, three blessings of praise. The back page. Section five, which says section five. Yeah. Then you have the middle 13 requests. This is a regular weekday. And the final three of Thanksgiving. So you should know what differentiates one Amida from the other, in other words, a weekday or a Shabbos or a Shchodesh or a Yontif, is the middle section. The first section and the last section are the same. Praise in the beginning, thanksgiving at the end. We learned that from Moses. We learned that from Moses in two places. At the end of his life, he... As he blesses the Jewish people and the tribes, we see he follows that pattern. First he praises the Almighty, then he requests the Almighty, petitions him on behalf of the tribes of the Jewish people, and finally he offers thanksgiving. 
And there are other models as well. When Moses himself requested to go into the land of Israel, first he, that actually was denied him, at least temporarily, it's been a long temporarily, first he praises God and then he requests. There was no thanksgiving because it didn't happen. At any rate, that remains the model. So you'll notice that the first three blessings are always the same and the last are the same. It's the middle that changes. We request during the week. On Shabbos and Yom Tov, we don't request. There's no requests. There's only a reference and description and thanking God for the Shabbos or the Yom Tov. But no request. Why don't we request on Shabbos and Yom Tov? Because Shabbos and Yom Tov is a taste of the perfect world. I'm not lacking anything. So I don't have anything to ask. Okay. So that is the, really the most critical parts of the Shema and the Amidah. But let's go from the beginning and just identify the, the sections. The morning blessings, I want to spoke about earlier. Being able to see, being able to walk, clothed, being able to be mobile, and so on. Section 2. Are we supposed to say those before getting out of bed? No, that's not said, no. What's said before you get, before you get out of bed is the moda ani. This not, no, you can. This is said after. Okay, this is practicality is lesson number three. But I'll just quickly answer you um, because you're going to do this tomorrow morning. Moda um, ani, in bed, you, you sit up, you put your hands together, and you bow your head slightly. That's the perfect way to do it. The morning blessings is already after. You've already gotten out of bed. You've relieved yourself. You've washed yourself, rinsed your mouth, washed your eyes out. Uh, and then washed your hands ritually in the kitchen. Maybe a second time, first time by the bed, a second time, and then the morning blessings. Okay. So let's go through it. So the morning blessings of page 5 to 9. Then section 2. This is a pretty, a pretty relatively a new addition to the prayer book. Carbonos, the sacrifices. Sacrifices, a typo there. Um, we quote the sacrifices every day. And the reason we do that, of course, is because, well, prayer is in place of sacrifices. So we actually quote the relevant verses in the Torah which talk about the sacrifices brought on that day and the offerings, the incense, and so on. That goes from page 12 to page 26. I will tell you now that this isn't... Since you just heard me say that this was added... Relatively recently, it is not as critical as the Shema and the Amida. And the truth is, there are a lot of guys who are observant who don't say this any, ever. So they come. Because the Shema has to be said before the, the, the third hour of the day, and in case you daven later, you say it earlier. That's the reason for that. Good question. I just made a shocking statement. I said there are some uh, uh, observant Jews. I'm not saying this is right. But who just habitually don't say any of this. Basically because they're learned. They know it was added later. And it's not that critical. And they come late to Shul. And they want to daven with the minion. They want to daven with the community. Because they figure, and rightfully so, if you get your petition in with everybody, there's a bigger chance of it being fulfilled. This is a whole subject, davening with the minion, not with the minion. Really, is a whole, it's a separate thing. But I'm just telling you, and there's people that I know never say this. They never come late. And they go launch right into wherever the minion is. The truth is, the truth is that when we understand the deeper level of prayer, I mean, this is exquisite and, and not something that, that you want to miss. But that's another story. Okay. Then comes section three. Section three, we're now building up, friends, to the Shema. It's called Psuke de Zimra, which means verses of praise. It's page 30 to 39, and it is taken primarily from the book of Psalms. King David wrote the book of Psalms. That's where most of this section comes from. A little secret. I know people who come habitually even later to Shul and never say this either. They start with section 30, with section 4, every day, believe it or not. That's because they're scholars, and they know that the Pesuk de Zimra, the verses of praise, was added fairly recently, and it augments prayer. It's not the heart of prayer. 
I'm not saying you should do this either. I'm just telling you for your edification, just to know. So now, here's something. That if you're praying every day, you don't compromise. For sure, nobody would. And that's section four, blessings of the Shema, the Shema itself. And then the blessings of the Shema that follow the Shema. I told you this too. The Shachris has two before and one after. And Mairev has two before and two after. And then comes section five, the Amida. Which, which is really the core prayer and divided the three sections we just identified. Section six, confessional prayer, enacted by our sages, is also fairly recent. By, the, by that I mean it's, it's, it's uh, millennia old, but fairly recent. And we only say the confessional life sinned and strike our hearts. We say this every day of the year, unless it's a day that has a festive or even minor festive character, it's not said. Not said, certainly not on Shabbos, not on Yom Tov, not on Shredesh, yes. Very good question. That's an excellent question. The Hasidus asks. How do you stand like that? What's that? How do you stand like that? Not forgiven. Yeah, so let me repeat Stanley's question. This is mighty strange that I'm asking God for forgiveness at the end of, of the prayer. It's the first thing. Clean your slate. Yep. All agree it's a good question. Yes. I'll answer it now. This will answer now. <laughs> Less than four. Oi, it's already nine o'clock. Having so much fun. I'll answer the question, friends, with a famous story of Rabbi Sadje Gaon. I think I referred to him earlier. I did. He was, Rabbi Amram was the first, Rabbi Sadje was the second to, to formulate the prayer, the Siddha as we know it. Here's the story. It's a very instructive story. Rabbi Sadja Gaon was once traveling and he came to a, a certain town and went to the inn where he was going to lodge. The innkeeper did not know that this was Rabbi Sadja Gaon and uh, welcomed him and showed him to his room, gave him his soap and his towel and all was fine. The next morning, people came from near and far to see the great rabbi, to get guidance, blessing and so on. And the innkeeper realized that this guest that he had welcomed the night before was none other than Rabbi Sadja Gaon. And he felt so ashamed. And this true story, he fell at his feet and begged his forgiveness. And the rabbi says, my good man, you know, he raises him, for what? He says, for the way I welcomed you last night. He said, it was perfectly fine. He said, yes, rabbi, but I'd known it was you who would be completely different. It's only because we've gone through the prayer, which you will appreciate next week, the spiritual inspiration that prayer needs to give us, that then my shortcomings, now I really become embarrassed. I did this. So we're only doing it's a, to shuva on this elevated level because we have prayed already, because we feel this nearness. You know, a very simple example, if you have a stain on a, a coarse everyday garment, who cares? That same stain on a silk shirt become it's the same stain. But the context, look what it's on. Right? So because we have refined ourselves and experienced prayer as we should, it's a spontaneous need now to say, I'm so sorry. We said we're sorry last night before we go to sleep, friends. Before we go to bed at night, by custom, we didn't even discuss the bedtime thing, um, it's an incredible way to go to sleep. Ask for forgiveness. And there's also a paragraph there which says, I forgive, this is more difficult, this is what I'm going to tell you now, is I forgive what anybody else did to me this day. What a way to go to sleep. <laughs> if we did that, we would sleep like babies. No question about it. Completely cleansed. But my point is, so we've forgiven others, we've asked God for forgiveness, and it's just the next morning, you know. So we're riding on, you know, the... the, the cleansed plate from the night before. So why the Tachanun now? It's because we've davened. Like any relationship, you know. Um, you know what it comes down to? It comes down to this. And we'll conclude with this point. We'll just wrap up the next sections, but this will be our message for tonight. The segue to next week. 
we talked about these two kinds of prayer. Two basic levels. One is my need, whatever that is, and it's multifaceted, we're complex. We have many needs. The second level of prayer is, isn't about me, it's about you. Now that's true of any relationship. Of course, you speak about marriage because of the ultimate relationship. It's the most challenging and the, most, and the deepest. And our relationship with God is likened to a marriage. In fact, that's where the idea of marriage comes from. It's God of the Jewish people. It's not a good idea, marriage. It's a godly idea. Huge difference. It's not a smart idea, but it's a divine idea. So, there's one way to go into marriage. Actually, there's only one way. Why would you marry this person? Why would you marry this person? Because this person fulfills your needs to your perception more than anybody else. It's going to start that way. can't start any other way. Although truth is, way back, it began, they jump-started to this next level. Because what marriage should evolve into is, not you serve me, but my privilege to be married to you and serve you. And in the old days, they jump-started level number one, and they just arranged it. They actually were the healthiest marriages. Because they just, you know, this is, forget, you go straight to the point. It's divine, it's mystical, it's your soulmate. God brings you together, and you serve each other. And you love it. And you revel in it. But we're not quite at that level to be able to have that transparent soul connection so quickly. So it starts off with the dating and, and then all of the calculations. And hopefully it will evolve into a real marriage one day. So back to prayer. What was I saying? Yeah, so I hear this like this. I mean, I'm in the business of a rabbi. So if you like it or not, these things come to your desk. And you learn. You learn by listening. A lot. That's how you learn. Because the truth is, if people talk enough, they're going to solve their own problems. Just let them... Be. Oh, you said it. But then no, that's the truth, because I can't give my solution. It's got to be yours. I just have to allow the person to speak enough to find it themselves. That's what a, I guess a therapist is supposed to do, is to allow the person to find their own answer, their own truth within. Anyway, so here's what, what you encounter from time to time keep this vague. Um, he or she, it doesn't matter which one, hurt the other one. And there's all kinds of degrees of hurt, obviously. But, so let's keep it in general terms. So he, he's frustrated. We'll say he's the one that did it. He, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry. And she just won't let go. Not fair. I said it once, I said it a second, and I meant it. So, so now what? So the answer, friends, is this. You know, in connection to your question, the same question, why are we saying Tachlan after the, the height of prayer? There's a law, the laws of Yom Kippur, that in Yom Kippur, a person is supposed to confess and ask and repent for sins that he, since his birth, which is long, he has long uh, regretted and not repeating. So why every year? It's Allah, it's Allah and the Rambam. A person has to confess. So the answer is again, this, this is the same answer. If it's a question of my failing in me, for God's sakes, I'm not doing it anymore, leave me alone, don't mention it again. But if it's a question of how could I have done it to you, then the deeper a relationship is, the more gewalt, what did I do? Gewalt, what did I do? He, whether it's us and God or our spouse, it's a, a natural and spontaneous need to say I'm sorry again to the point that she said, it's okay, don't say I'm sorry anymore. But you can't help it. Because as the relationship deepens and his appreciation of his spouse and the gift of their connection and the mystery of who that person is deepens, the more, and I said this, that's what prompts the I'm sorry. So because it's Jim Kippur again, and hopefully we're advancing our relationship with God and getting deeper and deeper, it's the natural response to say, I'm so sorry I did that. And that I'm sorry is deeper every year. In the first scenario, I said it once, come on. How many times should I repeat, I'm sorry? And if he has to say it again, all right, I'm sorry. 
but it makes you feel good to say it, hear it again. I'll say it again. I'm sorry. No. What we're describing now is he saying, I'm sorry. She's not asking for it. And it's deeper and deeper. Greater humility and greater appreciation. That's really the reason why we say Tachman every day after having gone through. And next week we'll appreciate more and more the ladder of prayer. So that when Hannah taught us, remember Hannah, mother of Samuel, she, she taught the essence of how to daven. It's the Amida. And you say it silently in your standing. She wasn't writing a protocol for how you pray. You get that book again? Oh, wait a second. This way. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, raise the voice. Is the pitch right enough? Can... No, she taught how to praise that it comes from here. When it comes deeper from here, you can't say it loud. You just can't. When you really feel standing in the presence of God in the most intimate, close way, that's not the place you're shouting. They don't shout in the bedroom. And that's really the term our sages, the Zohar, the Kabbalah uses to describe the temple's essence, the Holy of Holies. Chana is the one that taught us that. So for the guy, it becomes an instruction. We need instructions. But really, it's a natural result of the experience of prayer, which God willing, as we peel back the layers, we will discover next week and the week following. We're just going to conclude. So the Tachanun, and then in brackets, Torah reading, when the Torah is read, which is at least every three days, every three days, three days shouldn't go by without a Jew hearing the Torah being read. At least the guy's got to hear it. So it's Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos, often more often than that if it's Rosh Chodesh. And then you have the concluding prayers. These are all relatively uh, recent additions. Some going back to the Middle Ages. The only one there in the section 7 that's pretty old, which goes back to Talmudic times, is the song of the day, when a quick reference to that. What's the song of the day? We announce it every Shabbos and Shul, right? Song of the day, page? Who knows? 244. That could be. <laughs> so we did a reel. Yeah, yeah, he's going to tell us. Song of the day. What's the, so now I'm going to tell you what's the song of the day. The song of the day was that every day, when they brought the daily offering in the... Wait, I forgot that this is a camera here. I'm going to forget, huh? That's the end of that. Okay. Zolzine. What's that? Yeah, there could be, it could be an audio class. Yeah. Okay. That's funny. Uh, yeah, my apologies, but... So the song of the day is when the morning sacrifice was offered, was one in the morning, one in the evening, the Levim, the Levites, stood on, on a platform called the Duchen, which is with a koinim, would stand and bless the people daily, which is why it's called Duchenen. Duchen means a platform. Then anyway, back to the Levim, and they would sing. And there was a psalm for every day. That psalm, of course, reflected what was created on that day. And uh, there was at one time there were, if I recall correctly, maybe thousands of singers and instruments and harmonies. It must have been beyond heavenly, you know, to listen to this, and it elevated the whole, the whole offering to the most sublime spiritual plane. Just listening to that and seeing that. So every day they would sing that song, that particular psalm, corresponding to the first day of the week and so on, when they brought the offering. So each morning when we conclude the morning, the morning service, we will say the song that the Levites would sing on that day when the temple stood. Yeah, some questions. Let's open the floor a little bit. Section 5. Yeah, page 45, the first blessing ends on 46, Mog and Avram, shield of Abraham. Sec it, it ends, Gakel HaKodesh in 47 in the middle. The Holy God. Hakel HaKadosh. The Holy God. Middle of page 47. 
from the beginning of the Amidah till there, that's the same of every Amidah, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Sim, Chanak, they're all like that. That's the first three. I'm not following you. They are, starting on page 45, I'll walk you through. Ending on 46, Shield of Abraham. Then ending at the bottom of 46, who revived the dead. Ending middle of 47, Holy God. What are the last three? Starting with the Moedim. The Moedim on page 51. Top of the page, who restores his divine presence to Zion. That's one. The second one is 52. Uh, God, uh, uh, blessed are you, beneficent is your name, and to you it is fitting to offer thanks, is number two. And number three, page, page 53, Sim Shalom. Too fast. Again? We're asking for what? The last three? Starts on 51. Top of 51 is blessing number one of the last three. Middle of 52 is blessing two of the last three of thanks. And number three... Uh, uh, middle of 53 is the third blessing. And these three at the beginning and three at the end are the same for every Amid. Until what time can you do this, darling? Okay, that's, that's a lesson number three. But just to have an idea. Uh, so you're referring to what? Like the beginning. Section one, starting at one. Can we do it? Okay, so for the, for the woman, the answer is any time during the day. That's, yeah, the guy is more bound to the time thing. But not, not so much her. In fact, not at all. Um, before I let you go. Yes, question. I'm sorry? Section two. Section what? Three. Sukkot de Zimri, yeah. I didn't say, don't have to, I didn't say. I say that they, they, uh, not because, yeah. A woman, what do you mean? You can dove in any time, but you can't just, uh, what you can do is, say section, just stop, and then, you, you have, they have to be grouped in a certain way. That'll be lesson number three. If you're late, what could you say? What should you say? What should you skip? Well, what are you doing before you go? Which one? Section, which one are you saying? Which one? Which section? Great. The rest you can do any other time of the day. Not really, because... From Borosh Amata Yishtabach, it's one long blessing, really, and it should go uninterrupted into the Shema. So, you should continue till after the Amidah. If you're starting 30, you should go to the Amidah. I'm not saying you should do it. You have to, but if you're going to, you should go uninterrupted. That's really the third class. It's going to be the nitty gritty of I only have so much time. What should I say? I come late, but after here, what do I do? Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. By that you mean what kind of washing do you mean? That's what I'm asking. Like, let's say I, let's say I, I have breakfast. I have everything. Like, yeah. You know, if you wake up and you wash your hands, I don't hear you. Natural to say that you wash your hands. But if I pray later, should I wash my hands before praying? But you wash your hands in the morning already. No, but you said you just said a woman can pray how she wants. Right. So if I would pray later, should I wash my hands? A, a second time. Have you washed in the morning yet? So you're asking for a second time later during the day. It's a good idea. Not a bracha though. Don't make a blessing over it. But the ritual washing. Ideally, that's the best way. But just, in, just that's another. Before you pray, your hands have to be clean. So just regular under regular water. There's no water. One can even rub one's hands on wood. But ideally, that would be a nice thing to do. Yes. You don't. Not really. Uh, what? I shouldn't have answered that. Um, 
He used to walk barefoot, excuse me. He used to walk barefoot. But the truth is, no, no. Pardon? This is a sneered thing, more. It's actually, not so much sneered, even a person should wear shoes. A guy, I mean, say a male, a guy person. <laughs> should, should wear shoes. Why? Because it's respectful. Just respectful. It's simple answer, you should wear shoes, and that's respectful. In fact, you mentioned about shoes. In the laws of uh, tzedakah, poverty, and so on, it's a high priority a person should have shoes. Obviously clothes, but even though functionally it may be a climate where you don't need, you should have shoes. It's respect for the person. It's symbolic, since you're mentioning it, of your foot, the, the unique footprints you make in the world. Your path. The shoes, that, your journey. For when somebody dies, we give away their clothes, but not their shoes. Shoes are theirs. It's a very personal thing. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah, Comments? Yes. If somebody doesn't read Hebrew and doesn't know Aramaic, can we can be praying in English? Very good question. I should have mentioned that right away, but that's, section, that's lesson number three. The answer is yes, you can pray in any language. Then there comes the question I do. Pardon? Pardon? You should say the words, but the question we'll deal with, God willing, in the third class is. I do read Hebrew, but I read A slowly, and I don't know what I'm saying. So what is better? Is it better to read it in the English, I know what I'm saying? Or is it better to say it in the Holy Tongue? And I don't read so fast, so we'll deal with those, those, uh, sensi those sensitivities in the third class. Yes, Sarah. Yeah, they're all taped. They're all taped. I mean, audio for sure. I'll try and stand still next week. Ah, check, <laughs> chain me down. I totally forgot about the, the camera. First of all, it blocks people, so I want to see. So I'm trying to. I'll have to get a camera from on, on the top. Thank you uh, all for coming. Mr. Shell will continue next week.